There is often that juxtaposition in the evening chant. On the one hand, reflection of aging, illness, death, separation, or the chant on the world being swept away with nothing enduring, no shelter. And then the chant that says, May I be happy. May all living beings be happy. The first series of chants sounds pretty bleak, almost as if it offers no hope at all. But there is that reflection. I'm the owner of my actions. I'll fall heir to all the good and evil I do. In other words, the good you do leads to happiness. The good you don't do, or the things that you do that are not good, those lead to unhappiness. So the hope is offered right there in your own actions. And this is where, say, the Buddha throws us a lifeline. Because he recognizes that life without happiness is hardly worth living. People talk about how the drive to survival is basic, and it's actually it's more a deeper drive is the drive for happiness. There are times when survival, if it doesn't seem happy at all, no prospects for happiness, people would rather die. But there is the prospect for true happiness, and as the Buddha said, there's an ultimate happiness that's not touched by aging, illness, and death. This is why he talks so openly about these things. The chant just now that, that we're all subject to aging, illness, and death can also be translated as aging is normal, illness is normal, death is normal, and yet normally we don't like to think about these things. We push them away. And then because we push them away, then when they do come, they're over overwhelming. And a friend, a psychotherapist, one time was giving a, a talk had a conference on menopause, and most of the other speakers were talking about the various therapies to delay menopause. And her theme was, well, menopause is a good thing because it gives you time to stop and take stock of the fact that life is changing. You don't have much time left, but it's good to think about what's really worthwhile in your life and to focus on that. And she had the feeling as she was giving the talk that nobody wanted to hear that message. And the organizers of the event told her what a wonderful talk it was and how much everyone liked it, and she knew deep down inside that it wasn't true. And sure enough, the next year when they had that same conference, she was told that she was not going to be invited. This is what happens in a culture like ours that doesn't like to look at these things, because it doesn't think there's anything you can do about them. The whole reason the Buddha brings them up and has them as a daily reflection, not only that I am subject to aging, illness, and death, but all beings, no matter where they are, are subject to aging, illness, and death. It's to put things into perspective. It's to put your quest for happiness, your happiness and the happiness of the people you love, into perspective as well, that you've got to take these things into account. And then you've got to find the way to train the mind so it can find a happiness that takes these things into account as well. This is what we're doing as we meditate. Because what is the source of our actions, if not the mind? It's through our intentions that we act. And if we can learn how to train our intentions, that's where the prospect for happiness lies. So this is why we focus inwardly as we meditate. We're focusing, to begin with, on the breath. The breath itself may be subject to change, but it gives you something to hold on to. It's difficult right in the beginning to focus directly on the mind. So you focus on the breath because the breath is near the mind. It's near your awareness. Any where that you're aware of the body, that you're aware of the body, it's because of the breath energy. Breath here doesn't mean just the in and out breathing, but just the flow of energy throughout the body. So notice where you feel that flow. 
It might be around the nose, or it might be in the chest and the abdomen. You might feel it in your shoulders. Anywhere. When you really get sensitive to this energy flow, you can feel it even down in your fingers and toes. But in the beginning, focus on the area where you can feel it most distinctly, knowing now the breath is coming in, now the breath is going out. And allow the breath to be comfortable. Try not to force it or squeeze it too much. And one of the first things you'll notice is the mind has trouble staying here. It's going to wander off. That's because that's what it normally does. It normally wanders around. This is why we take breath. The mind gets curious about a certain idea or a certain state of being or something that appears in the mind, and it goes for it. And suddenly you find yourself in this different world. The process that you see on the small scale here is the same process that happens on the large scale. So when you find yourself slipping off into another thought world, just drop it. You don't need to pursue it. You don't need to see where it goes or to tie up any loose ends. Just leave the loose ends loose. Come back to the breath. And again, come back to, in a way that's like coming back to an old friend. Because after all, the breath is your friend. It's what keeps you alive. And when you learn to get sensitive to it and you can learn to maintain the breath energy with a sense of ease, then it does more than just keep you alive. It keeps you healthy, it gives you a sense of feeling at home here in the present moment. So as you're focusing on the breath, just pose the question, what kind of breath would feel good now? And then what would feel good now? And just keep, keep that up with each breath, because sometimes the needs of the body will change over time. And sure enough, it'll go wandering off again. Well, you bring it back and bring it back, as I said, as coming back to an old friend. Learn to see your thoughts not as thoughts about something, but see them as a process. The mind creates these little worlds, and you can stand outside them. There's actually a point where you choose to go with the thought, get inside it and go with it to wherever it's going to take you. Most of us don't realize that we have the choice. These worlds just are there, and we're in them. We don't know what happened in the meantime. It's like someone came up and put a big sack over us and picked us up and threw us off and placed us someplace else. But when you find that happen, you come back to the breath. Re-establish, as I say, re-establish your awareness right here on this level, the level of the body being right here. There are three qualities that you need in order to do this. Once you've made up your mind, you're going to be with the breath. And the first quality you bring to it is mindfulness, which means keeping the breath here in mind. Don't let yourself forget. The second quality is alertness. Try to be as sensitive as you can to how the breathing is feeling, knowing when it's coming in, knowing when it's going out, knowing when you're with the breath, and knowing when you're not. And the third quality is ardency, which means you try to do it well. What this means is when you realize that you've left the breath, you just drop wherever you've gone to, no matter what the thought is, no matter how compelling it may seem. That's not what you need right now. What you need right now is some peace of mind with a breath. So as soon as you realize you've slipped off, come right back. While you're with the breath, and ardency means, on the one hand, being as sensitive as possible to how the breathing feels, and then also continuing to pose that question, what would feel good right now? And then going with it, whatever feels good. So those are the three qualities you need to bring to this practice. Again, watch out for the mind slipping off. Years back when I was in Thailand, 
was bitten by a dog one day on, on Elms Road. And so I was taken into the hospital, given a, given a shot, tetanus shot. The dog was not, it was not, wasn't a mad dog, it was just an angry dog. So I was given a tetanus shot, and then the next day as I was walking on my arms around it, the pain got really unbearable. My leg was swelling. And I happened to get back to the house where I had been bitten by the dog, and as the, the wife of the house was putting food in my bowl, I fainted. And just before I lost consciousness, I had this vision of America. And then I was out like a light for a while, and then I came back to. Later on, I happened to mention that to a John Fu, and he said, well, if I, I had died at that point, that's where I would have been reborn, in line with the vision. This is what happens as people die. They, a thought world appears, and at that point they realize they can't stay in the, in the body any longer, and so they just go with whatever, whatever appears. A couple years later, I had an accident in which I was electrocuted. And the first thought that went through my mind as I realized I was being electrocuted was that I'm going to die from my own stupidity. I didn't check the current first before I touched this thing. And then lots of thoughts came up. Regret about things I had done, regret about things I hadn't done. I realized I could not let myself go with a regret. And then it was watch, like watching little worlds come up. Thoughts about this person, thoughts about that person. I just kept saying, nope, 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 I'm not going there. Stay with what I could with the body. Fortunately, the current turned off very quickly. People who saw the incident said it was just a split second. But for me, it was like five minutes. When the mind realizes it's in a tough position, it spins a lot faster than normal. But again, I had a strong sense that if I had gone with any of those things, that's where I would have gone if I had died. So it's really good to learn this skill so that you can at least choose where you're going to go. You can step out of those thought worlds. You don't have to jump into whatever comes up. This is why mindfulness, alertness, and ardency are so important, because these are qualities that you can develop. It's like developing a muscle. You exercise it. And you want to be strong. It's not the case that you have to wait until you get a strong muscle. You take the weak muscle you have and you exercise it over time, and then it becomes strong. It's the same with these qualities in the mind. In the beginning, it's easy to get discouraged as you See the mind wandering off for the umpteenth time. But don't get discouraged. The fact that you see it is a good sign. You bring yourself back. That ability to bring yourself back is what's going to be, turn into your concentration, turning into good, stronger mindfulness, stronger alertness. So try to enjoy bringing yourself back. Because you come to realize this spot, being here with a breath where you can watch what's happening in the mind, watch what's happening in the body, is really the best place to be. You can monitor things. You can gain some control. There's even an element of control over the body. As you get more sensitive to the comfortable sense of the breath, you can learn to maintain that in different situations. And it's good for the health of the body. The sense of the breath energy flowing throughout the whole body it means that every part of the body is getting properly nourished with energy, with the blood flow, much more likely to stay healthy. Cuts through a lot of stress diseases. And as for the mind, it's good to have a place to stay. After all, the world is swept away. But here you've got a home that's not swept away by the world. You've got a place where you can take shelter. The, the world doesn't give you shelter, but you can make shelter here. And when 
things come up in the mind, you, you're in a position to decide whether it's worth going with them or not. Especially when you can de develop a sense of well-being, being here in the present moment. Because all too often we go th with things from a sense of hunger, a sense of need. We're lacking something here in the present, so we're looking for it someplace else. But when you can develop a sense of ease, well-being, fullness here, then when you're coming from a position of fullness, you're less likely to be hungry, less likely to go for things that you know deep down inside are not going to provide any genuine satisfaction, which can actually bring pain and suffering. And you can also begin to question that the compulsion to need to go with the pain and suffering, like you owe it to someone else, say you're suffering over what's happened to somebody else, and yet it, it feels selfish not to suffer with them. But that's, that's not the case at all. When you're in a good position, you're in a better position to help them while they're here, even after they've gone. Because the mind does transmit transmits a current of energy. You may have noticed that sometimes you walk into a room where two people have just had an argument, and the feeling in the room is very different than if they'd just been sitting there chatting. It's the energy of the minds that creates that atmosphere. And if you can develop a sense of well-being inside, you're sending off good energy, which other people can pick up on. So when you're meditating here and developing a sense of inner well-being, it's not a selfish process. You're turning your mind into a transmitter of well-being. Which can help people who are alive around you, also help people who have passed on. Especially when someone has just passed on, they're very sensitive to these currents of energy. So you want to give them as much good energy as possible. So you're focusing on the breath, trying to develop these three qualities. Mindfulness, keeping the breath in mind. Alertness, being alert both to the breath and to whether you're staying with the breath or not. And then ardency, the desire to do it well, sticking with it, putting energy, being intent on what you're doing. So the mindfulness gets stronger, the alertness gets sharper. And you learn, learn how to relate to the breath in a way where you really are friends. You're on good terms with the breath. The breath is on good terms with you. This gives rise to a sense of ease and well-being that comes from being steadily focused on something where you feel at ease with the object. The ease will grow. First it starts out just like a gentle feeling of being okay. But if you learn to protect it, it grows into something more. It's like shielding a little f fire that you're trying to start. You want a big fire. We well, have to start with a little fire. And you're starting a fire in the wind, so you need to protect it. If you start the fire and it seems small, then you snuff it out because it seems too small. It's never going to become a large fire. But if you start the small fire and then protect it, it grows. The stronger it grows, the bigger it grows, the ultimately reach a point where you don't need to protect it so much anymore. But in the beginning stages, you have to watch after it very carefully. Because it's so small and the wind is so strong. So have a protective attitude around the breath, a protective attitude around your awareness of the breath. And from this little tiny flame, ultimately there'll be a larger sense of well-being that you can then suffuse throughout the body.
that you, you yourself benefit from it and the people around you benefit as you begin to transmit the, kind of, transmit the kind of energy that comes from a mind at ease, a mind that can live in the world with its normal aging, and norm, normal illness, normal death, normal separation, and it have a happiness that doesn't have to be affected by these things. In other words, try to develop the mind so it comes from a position of strength. Find the resources inside. They are there. And then through the meditation, learn how to nurture them. So that wish for happiness, may I be happy, wouldn't sound so plaintive and weak in the face of the, the way the world is. Think about the life of the Buddha. I mean, he was coming from a, a lot of wealth, a lot of power, yet he realized that that kind of happiness wasn't enough. He said, is there a happiness that's not dependent on being young and healthy and alive? And all his friends said, oh, these are the things you need to be happy. Don't think about anything beyond this. And he said, if you can't think about anything beyond this, it's a miserable life. It's a miserable happiness. And so out against all the odds, he decided to drop everything he had and go out into the wilderness to see what this potential for human effort could do. Unfortunately for us, he found it, that it is possible through your efforts to develop a happiness that's not dependent on conditions. And then other people listened to his teaching, put it into practice, and all of a sudden it wasn't just one person with a very plaintive and quixotic quest. There was a lot of people finding that what he had found really did give results. So again, this is why he was so open about talking about aging, illness, death, and separation, and all the things that make us miserable. Because he, because he said, you know, with that fifth reflection, okay, we do have our actions. We have the power of choice, the power of our efforts. And these can make a difference. And even though they themselves are conditioned, they can lead to something that is unconditioned. that turns the tables, that the desire for happiness is not a weak thing in the face of the world, but it's something that's bigger than the world. So we start with this wish for happiness, we start with this seems like a little potential for it, but if you take good care of both the wish and the potential, they grow. 